Now, I said 13 minutes, Gabe and I were going to solve this whole problem. We did it literally during the break. So we're going to now present our findings. <laughs> Gabe was. Here we go. Gabe's been thinking about this one for a while. He he, I'm he sure was, he has. Yes, he was ready to rock on the on the <laughs> solution here. So we're hanging out with Dr. Gabe Trujillo, TUSD school board. Excuse me, TUSD school superintendent, and uh, we are here. I said, hey, how do we get this better? How do we get this this third grade <laughs> uh, literacy to a point where? a lot of more kids in Tucson have the opportunity to be better students and then whatever they're going to do post K-12 in their life. Because what Gabe said is that you said earlier that if this child does not hit a certain proficiency by the end of third grade, the rest of school is an uphill battle. It is. So it is. we're going to try to nip this in the bud right now. So first and foremost, I asked you about curriculum for uh, K, uh, excuse me, pre-K. And we need someone needs to find what is the I'm just gonna put your mic on a little bit um, the accepted good one that we can all work with that's actually going to do the job right right so that's number one number two uh, pay increasing the pay for K three if these these might be the most important teachers you have these will be the mm-hmm. most important educators that we have uh, pretty much in the system uh, and so we have to find a way if we're gonna start you have to attack the um the incentive to get them there and then some of the stuff on the list will at- will attack the conditions that will keep them there number th- number 3 we have smaller class sizes smaller class sizes if you what we we have seen in some of our schools that have done great things like a van buskirk like an ochoa like a fruit tendler like a soling tom when you walk through these classrooms these these teachers have found a way to make big small they function really really well with smaller groups of kids that are in stations that they're able to work with struggling readers in small groups of three or four while other students might be on a digital tablet, you know, working with an online catalog. So you've got to find a way to get smaller class sizes so that the teachers can really get more personal attention to the struggling reader. What is the, what do you think an average class size for kindergarten is right now in TUSD? The average size for kindergarten at at at, at uh, TUSD is it's way bigger than we're all than any of our board members or myself are are, are a fan of. It's just a, a function of our budget at this point. It's twenty six, and that's a lot. That's a lot when you're dealing with students that have serious reading problems. And I'd like to see us one day get to about eighteen or nineteen. Okay, that's a that's a way more reasonable number. Totally agree. Uh, then we had number four, uh, highly trained teacher assistants. You have to have somebody in the room with the highly qualified teacher because one of the best ways to teach literacy is to do what's called the balanced literacy approach, where in a 60-minute or 90-minute block, you have three stations of students running. If you have 18 students, the teacher can work in a small group intensive way with six you may have another six kids reading to themselves, practicing the skill of reading to self. Then you might have another six kids on digital tablets, navigating some grammar activities or some online catalogs. Are we, are we tapping into retirees as well as we could to serve this? We're tapping into retirees, retired teachers. A, a, a highly trained teacher's assistant will help come in and provide that backup support so that teachers can really focus in on those struggling readers. All right. Small group intensive reading interventions. You have to have a really highly trained teacher that is able to provide what we call tier three reading support. And every in every kindergarten class, let's say 25, you're going to have four or five what I call tier three reading situations. These kids are basically at this point non-readers, and they're going to need some very intensive one-on-one support, which is where... If you've got a teacher's assistant that's able to engage the rest of the class, you're creating space for that teacher to really sit down and do that work with these kids. K through three, K three guidance counselor, social worker kind of support. Talk about that. We need to really start taking a look at focusing our counseling efforts and assigning counselors to case manage uh, some of these really struggling students that aren't reading at the K-3 level. Because usually you only get that at high school, right? You only get it at high school. And what we see with these students that have these low literacy levels, guess what's not far behind? Behavior. And so I'm not reading. I'm frustrated. I'm angry. I'm going to misbehave. And so having a structured environment where we have counselors that are case managing 
these these children and really delivering a socio-emotional learning curriculum to these kids in a systematic way that focuses on impulse control, decision making, behavior management, I think is largely missing and is a huge component of high quality literacy instruction. Then um, having K-3 infrastructure. Yes, when I talk about the infrastructure of K-3, so much of the issue are students that lack a literacy-rich environment in their home, not a book in sight. We need to have K-3 classrooms that mimic libraries across this district and across the county. There should be wall-to-wall books in every single K-3 classroom. There should be fully stocked digital libraries loaded on tablets so that there's always a literacy-rich environment. We would need strong Internet support, access to digital um, access to digital resources and devices and an investment in good old fashioned books. Right. So that there we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Anything else you can think of uh, that would uh, be a boon to? So we're talking age three, you know, basically from age three to now third grade. You're talking like three to seven or eight. Right. Yeah. What else? What else? What, I mean, there's a lot there on there, but anything else that you can think of that we can make that reading proficiency literacy better by the time we get to third grade? You know, we also talked about addressing the issue of pre-K and we're piloting a, a for the first time, we're piloting a curriculum that's going to be standardized in all of our preschools. It's called the TELL curriculum. It was just recently developed out of Arizona State University. We're going to be able to pilot it for free. And it, it's got some really strong components with early literacy and numeracy and socio-emotional learning. So I'm excited to see that get going. But if we do these eight things and we do them in a high-quality way, um, we can really change the landscape of the K-3 environment. I think in the end, in the longer term, is it changes Tucson Yes. overall for everybody. Yes. You and, know? And if I can add a ninth thing here, Chris, sure. we're also going to have to invest in professional development because the K-3 teacher in order to be masters of their craft, especially in this environment, we can't survive if we're only giving them 45 minutes of professional development built into their day every week. Right. So we would have to make a serious investment in wrapping around these teachers and providing them high quality PD. The, um, I guess for me, um, everything that we talk about in Pima County, this region, can get so much better if we can just tackle this. I just feel like this should be the <clears throat> educational issue before all others is this. That's correct. Um real quick, I do have one last TUSD question for you. And I I'm going to we're going to I'm going to work with some way smart people and we're going to put this together into a real <clears throat> thing and then I'll send it to you to give it a little look see over. Sure. And then we'll see if we can Someone uh, in the business community challenged me, so what are you going to do about it? Well, we're going to start here and try to put out the uh, what we need to get done. Uh, real quick before we go, Zach's coming up on Tipping Point. Um, talk about this lunch thing, this this thing that you guys voted 5-0 to put a little restrictions on what was going on. In the, it was costing you 350000 last year. And it costs you an extra three fifty just halfway through the year. You got it. Uh, we we're we we're on track to spend almost eight hundred thousand dollars by the end of the year. Um, so I want to thank our governing board last night. They they took action five zero to put some restrictions. So essentially, we're going to be implementing a two meal requirement um, before you're just get simply given a cheaper alternative meal. Now now some people call that lunch shaming. Um, we call it being fiscally responsible and so compassionate. How is it being abused? Explain real quick. Well, we got what, about, what was being we got about two minutes. what was being abused is the current practice um, was that there would be no restrictions at all. There there would be no alternative meal if a student hit a lunch register across this district, any age, any grade level, and simply didn't pay. They would be provided the exact same lunch as everybody else. Right. What we saw was there were spikes of students not paying for their lunch and receiving the free school meal on the days that we would bring in pizza. Uh, Because we, we, you know, we had made a deal with Domino's pizza because the high school kids, I'd done a lot of focus groups and, and to try to create a win for them, they wanted to see a little bit more diversity at lunch. So, okay. So we bring in Domino's and lo and behold, it's the high school kids leading the way. Right. Okay. Producing the bulk of the unpaid debt and spike specifically occurring on the days that we're offering the pizza. Oh, my gosh. So we did take some action last night where we'll be implementing a two-meal 
minimum that you would be able to get the school lunch. And then we're going to shut the faucet off. Right. And I believe that the board settled on you can, if you don't have any money, we'll provide you a cheese stick and some grapes and some piece of fruit and, and milk, which, which is end up going to cost us maybe a dollar a meal versus taking the $3 hit. Gotcha. Okay. Well, <coughs> kudos to your board on a 5 vote. Yes. So thanks for your uh, thanks for your uh, service as always, sir. Thanks for the uh, solving literacy in Tucson with me today. Well, thank you. It's always great to be here. Uh, wake up Tucson. Look forward to the next visit. All right, sir. Good luck. Thank you, sir. Hashtag pray for Gabe. I really do mean it. He's got a lot of hard work to do over there. So uh, Zach's coming up on Tipping Point and, of course, followed by uh, Mr. Hugh Hewitt, Billy Buckmaster, Dave Ramsey. We'll see you tomorrow. Ryan Larson, Hank Amos, Tucson Realty. Justine Wadsack, she's, uh, she's a CD2 candidate. She's got a special announcement tomorrow. And then I think Greg's going to come in from our podcast and uh, talk about the next uh, Tucson History podcast. Wake up.